Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Jim K. Ford Sends Nation podcast. It's great to have you along. It is Steve Warren along with the coach, Greg Kennedy. And coming up today, the Sends, uh, like bef- seconds before we fired up the mics here, have signed to an entry-level contract Stephen Halliday out of Ohio State. The Sens go back into a struggling mode. It has been a streaky team here in the second half. Four or five wins, and then four or five losses in a row. Now they're on a three-game slide after a loss since we last got together. A loss to the St. Louis Blues and the Boston Bruins. They lost to Carolina as well, so it's a three-game slide at the moment, and they're getting beat up pretty good in each and every game. Don Shaw, the Sens doctor, is going into the Sens ring of honor, and uh, Brady Kachuk. The young Kachuk family is about to expand by one in September. All straight ahead here on the Jim K. Ford Sands Nation podcast. Greg, how are you today? Very good, Stephen. A, a day off today and a nice relaxing day. I'm preparing for a big, big camp this weekend. We're Team Lebanon in Montreal, heading down to Montreal tomorrow. We've got about 35 guys coming in and going to see what we got for the coming. Uh, we got a bunch of tournaments and some friendlies and stuff coming up this weekend so, or this summer. So uh, we got camp tomorrow. Yeah, looking forward to it. Very nice. People sometimes might wonder, why do you call him the coach all the time? Is that like the coach from the old TV show Cheers or something like that? Well, you come come by it honestly. Yes, Greg uh, has uh, coached for, well, uh, since he was in the womb. He was actually instructing uh, how to uh, set up D-zone coverage while in the womb. That's it's been a long time. You've been at the like, give me a couple of your stops. Team Lebanon, you're running the men's program for Team Lebanon. Give me a couple of your other stops over the years. Uh, let's see. I, I, uh, the Carlton University Ravens for uh, five years prior to uh, just before Fred Parker went in there. I uh, had some stops in the CJHL or the CCHL in Canada. I spent some time in the PN, was in Cumberland, coached the local junior B league. Uh, about 15 years of triple a minor midget and bantam i've been at it about over 40 years steve at one level or another it's nice kind of, kind of crazy i guess but you know whatever and thus yeah. why he's are. called the coach yeah so i don't think we ever discussed that either i just started calling you the coach <laughs> i think near the start of the podcast and it kind of stuck so yeah. anyway that's the background of it uh let's launch in here though Tough couple of games for the Sens since we last got together. Losses to the Boston Bruins and the St. Louis Blues, and really the same kind of deal. It just it feels a little bit like a movie you've seen several times. Um, at least that's how it is for me. It seems like they just give up, uh, you know, an early goal or two, and then they're chasing the game. And the third period, things fall apart. Y- you feeling like there's a bit of a template to what the Sens are laying down right now? Most definitely. You know, we we talk about every players, and we want the player to find their role. I don't know that the individual players have found their, their roles, but collectively, the Ottawa Senators have a role, and they play that role pretty much every game now. Uh, step on the ice in the first period. Make sure you fall behind by one or two. You know, preferably two, it seems to be the number these days. Uh, outshoot the opposition and look pretty good doing it, but make sure you fall behind and then spend the rest of the night playing catch-up and fail at that endeavor. That's that's what it's been the last three games. And was, was it the prior three were three overtimes? Uh, shootouts and overtimes wins and then yeah. that, that was yeah. a script they had down pat so then they said well let's try this role now and now the role is let's see if we can come from behind every night uh, against very good hockey clubs in carolina boston st louis these are these are not teams you can afford to fall behind uh early yeah. hope to have any chance of coming back and it's it's proven to be true in three straight games now one thing just popped into my head right now because i'm thinking about the mental side of the game for this club because it almost seems like they get overexcited, like, hey, oh, we've got it figured out now, and then some good teams come in and straighten them out. No, you don't have it figured out yet, fellas. Uh, still uh, some work to be done, and the mental side of it, it factors in. And and I, and like I said, we didn't talk about this leading into the show as a topic, but um, what did you think of Steve Steos at the NHL GM meetings this week when Gino Retta of TSN basically asked him straight out, um, you think the playoffs are potentially – in the mix and Steos answered something along the lines of, uh, you know, don't want to really get into expectations. Expectations were a bit debilitating for us. Mm -hmm. And that might be the most controversial thing that I've heard Steve Steos say in that, you know, you you fire out expectations being debilitating. 
It makes me wonder if this team ever should, if, if that's true, like if Steos is right and this club was debilitated by the notion of expectations from, you know, the Craig Buttons of the world who was saying, I'm buying stock in the Ottawa Senators. I'm buying big. Um, if you are debilitated by expectations like that, your expectations probably shouldn't have been that high to start with. I, I found the messaging a little weird, true, Steve. The same, same as you're sort of saying here, too. Um, yeah. And, and it, it, almost, it almost proves as an excuse uh, for Pierre Dorian, who never wanted to say playoffs, right? <laughs> Towards the end, all Pierre ever wanted to say was meaningful games, meaningful games. And he even seemed that that was the mantra coming out of the players in the room. Like, come yeah. on. Like, you're professional athletes. You're trying to tell me that if we expect a certain level of performance out of you, that's too much. That's debilitating. That seems strange. You know, Mike Keenan, no matter what dressing room he ever went into, whatever team he joined, the first thing he went up on the wall was a picture of the Stanley Cup and said, this is the goal, the only goal. You know, I just yeah. I find it strange that it's debilitating if you're expected to make the playoffs. I just I find that hard to believe. Why shouldn't they be expected to make the playoffs? Every team, that should be at least your first goal. Right, like your your first singular goal this season is we want to be in the playoffs. So, I, I debilitating is a very strong word. Yeah, I think so. I I don't think expectations had much to do with it. You know, the dialogue that people thought this team was capable of really good things, playoff team, and maybe make some noise when they got there. Um, yeah, sure, it adds a little extra pressure, but I think the reason they came undone, um, and there are many. Um, <laughs> is the way they played on the ice. They, they they didn't play great defensive zone coverage. They weren't physical. Like how many times in the last two three games did you see defensemen standing beside players in the front of that net? I understand it's a different world than you know the world that grew up when we were you know when we were in our youth. We'd watch the NHL games and guys would get absolutely pulverized in front of the net. You can't do that anymore. You're going to get called for cross checking or holding or whatever. Um, but you can still compete. You can still box out. You can still get your stick under another guy's stick in that slot area. How many times did we see that here in, the, in this three-game losing slide where defensemen are you know, nowhere near the guy in front and he's able to do whatever he wants? In the Bruin game, that was one guy I never heard of before who ended up with two goals, because, largely because he was allowed to just do whatever he wanted without anybody coming near him. Yeah, it's terrible. The, the defensive home base is not strong. It, it never really has been, but it really shows when you're playing against big, strong, uh, upper echelon teams who go to the dirty areas. Uh, goals happen at the net. This just in. And, and on top of that, sticks score goals, guys. So you need to be tying up sticks. Uh, yeah. The number one issue in there is that, that first and foremost, there's way too many rebounds. And I've, I've said this before, especially Forsberg. He just is incapable of smothering the first shot ever it seems there's always a loose puck floating around there in the blue paint or just outside it the second issue is i find too often the defenseman you got to be skates up ice like you have to be seeing when the shot's coming like you can't clutch and grab and bear hug a guy in front of the net and, and just you know have the guy covered until the puck arrives what you have to do is wait and watch and see here comes the shot okay now i engage you want to box a guy out you got to be skates up ice to see when the puck's coming so you can box the guy out, and the first step of boxing him out is to tie up that stick. Because stick score goals, which is the third issue: the rebounds facing the wrong way, and then not doing your job when the puck does arrive. It's just how many times when there's a loose puck scrambled laying around in there, are all two or three, or sometimes the highlights in the last game. There's four Senators fishing for that loose puck instead of just I'm going to tie my guy up so he can't get it first and foremost. I'll worry about one of you other guys getting the puck. Let's just tie up my man. Instead, they all want to go get the same puck. Uh, and then eventually some guy from the other team beats them to it and chips it in the net. Yeah. I mean, just puck watching, I think, is their biggest issue when it comes to D-zone coverage. They just, what's that guy with the puck doing? And then, you know, w w we saw it was Colton Pareko, I think it was, who came rolling in from the blue line, and everybody had their back to him. They had no idea he was coming in, and he buries, I think, what was the second goal in the Blues game. Like that, that's a just a I think a common thing, a common thread in that D zone coverage. They just get too focused on the puck and on the other end of the ice, you know, they had their chances. Like this team is generating ever. opportunities, but they're just not burying them. And and they continue to make these goalies that 
fans have never heard of in some cases, <laughs> look like the greatest goalie of their generation. I'm sure that's happened half a dozen times this year where the other team comes in, they put their back up in there, you know, this is the 28th place team in the league or whatever they're at right now. Um, and they, you know, they give their starter a night off and yet the backup guy comes in and just plays the lights out and just, uh, you know, the offense that, that, you know, the top six will throw Tarasenko into that mix as an overall look at the uh, entire season. It's impressive on paper, but too many nights they just go cold as far as burying the puck. It's, it's almost like every single one of them together at the same time all go cold. Like one night yeah. they're, they're shooting like crazy and they all look good and they're flying around the ice and, you know, two or three guys have got three or four points. And then the next night, not one of them can seem to do a thing. You just can't buy a goal. And they do have a, a habit of making backup goaltenders look real good. Now, of course, the backup goaltender is probably motivated. He doesn't get to play very often. He gets a start. You know, he gets a start. Regardless of who it is, he's going to play his best. And they do have a they do a real good job of making them look good. Uh, but this was not a case of shooting it right at them on their chances or, you know, missing the net or shooting it wide. These were, this time, the St. Louis game, like, my God, this guy made some stellar, stellar saves. This was not a case of of making him look good. Uh, he, he made himself look good, making some big stops. Yeah. 18-6, to six, the Sens have been outscored in the last three games, so they're not exactly riding the ship at the moment. And I am seeing a little bit of negativity. Well, a lot of negativity, but big picture negativity. To me, I have negativity right now about the team, but it's in it's it's in a small window because I I don't put any of this on the existing management, and I try and keep a like a bigger picture look at things as well. And I probably you know what I'm going to come across as corny right now, Greg, <laughs> but uh, there's a friend of mine, and she looks at everything in her life, even the mundane stuff she doesn't want to do. She looks at it with a I get to kind of mentality. And I kind of look at that with the same lens when it comes to NHL hockey in my hometown. I grew up without, as anybody who's, I don't know, 45 and under did, uh, you grew up not watching a team in your hometown, an NHL club. I just don't want, I guess I'm long-winded way of getting at it. I'm, I'm just sort of putting it out there, the Sens Nation, to just keep it in a small window. I understand it's seven years without the playoffs. But you've got a new owner. You've got a new group. I, I guess I'm encouraging people to try and keep things positive because, you know, it's it really is neat to get to cheer for NHL hockey or watch NHL hockey right here in our hometown. And I just don't want this new group to be absolutely bathed in the grief and criticism that the former regime deserved exclusively. <laughs> Our team may suck, and they're not doing well, and we're not going to make the playoffs again. But at least we have a team. I can right. go watch them play. Now, when I go watch them play, they may lose, but at least I can go watch them play. I have a team. I I have a yeah. team right here in my own hometown. So I, I get your point, and you and it's a it's a very valid one. You could be living in Atlanta, trying again for the third time to get a team to come. You could be in Quebec City. You know, cities, there's lots of cities out there that, that you either had a team and lost it or have never had one. So we do have one. And I, and I, you know what, having said that, do you really think that if they had to do it over again, like if, if we were talking expansion again right now, do you think Ottawa would be on the list? Do you think Ottawa would be a place to consider for an expansion team if we'd never gotten one? It was a bit of a fluke when it happened. And really, it only happened because they said, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll pay the money. And all the other cities were like, no, nah, stumbling and bumbling to come up with the money. We were lucky we even got a team. We were lucky it remained here through a bankruptcy, through some terrible times financially. And we still got a team, folks. So we need to stick with it. We were doing way better than a lot of other places. Yeah, I respect Gary Bettman for the fact that he's resistant, no matter what the market or the circumstances, to seeing teams fail like Arizona oh my god how much how much more tedious could a market be than Arizona but Gary Bettman is it keeps trying to do everything he can to keep teams from moving around yes the Jets uh the Nordiques you know there have been teams that have left on his watch but he's been resistant to it and uh that's been a good thing having said that he was not the guy 
that was in charge when the Sens and the Tampa Bay Lightning got their franchises. That was John Ziegler's world. And uh, I would wonder, in a, uh, to your question earlier, mm-hmm. would the Sens even be considered for a team right now if expansion came along? My feeling is absolutely not. Not in today's Gary Bettman world. And so, uh, yeah, that's another layer to the take of uh, very fortunate to have an NHL team. If you love the NHL, um, keep things in perspective. And there are better days ahead, I think, with this new group. Um, so kumbaya. moving on now. Yeah, it was a little kumbaya, a little corny, I guess. But as I just, it was one too many people I saw on social media this oh, week saying right. things like, I can't even watch this team right now. I always watch every game with a, with a fresh set of eyes. It, it sucks that you don't have... You don't have this specter of the playoffs and the potential of it uh, hovering over the team. It probably hasn't been since, I don't know, late December, realistically. But So I've removed that, but I still watch each game unto itself, like almost like an exhibition game. It's like, okay, we're going to play a game here. Let's win this game. And that's kind of how I look at it. But, uh, yeah, it is a bit kumbaya. So let's move along quickly because uh, people are going to get cavities from the sweetness here. Um, Stephen Halliday got signed today, entry-level contract. It's a two-year entry-level contract that won't kick in until next season. And uh, he was a diamond in the rough. He's uh, really stepped up in the last couple of years at Ohio State, been roughly a -a point-a-game guy. Uh, Good-sized centerman, about six foot three, just over 200 pounds, and uh, was not drafted for two drafts. And the Sens decided to roll the bones on him in 2022, getting him um, as a 20-year-old. And so, yeah, he signs, and uh, now I guess he's going to report to Belleville on an amateur tryout. His deal with the Sens won't kick in until the fall, but uh, I don't know if you had a a chance to see any of Ohio State or not, but he looks like he could be a potential prospect, maybe reminiscent of a Zach Ostapchuk type. Um, Not sure what Ostapchuk's going to be just yet, but they kind uh, kind of have similar molds. He probably projects into a bottom six role or a career American leaguer um you know he's not he's not gonna be racking up the points in the National Hockey League but it's another body it's a big big body it's six foot three and we've said all along that's that's what this team needs they need big guys that play strong that play hard to play both ends of the ice um, not exactly uh tearing it up in in the NCAA but a point of game guy so he can he can he can produce at that level anyway it just remains to be seen. So we'll go down to Belleville. There's lots of ice time to be had down there with the injuries in Ottawa and guys coming up and up and down all the time. He'll, he'll get an opportunity to play in Belleville. Let's see what he does for the next month or so anyway. Yep. Speaking of a stop, Chuck, he's been sent down by the Ottawa Senators after, I think, a favorable impression that he left on the organization. Certainly that first game was amazing. We talked about that in the last episode. But, uh, you know, I mean, as it usually goes, there's a lot to learn um, coming up to the NHL and, uh, and and the grind of doing it shift after shift, night after night. Well, Angus Crookshank has been called up and Ostapchuk has been sent down. And uh, at the moment, I think Crookshank probably looks a little more NHL ready. What do you think? Yeah, I would agree. And, and Crookshank also, uh, of all of them, I think he's the one that's got the best opportunity to maybe produce some stats offensively consistently you know, I, I, I've seen enough of Smigel or Smigel there that I was Smigel, whatever. I don't know. Yuri Smigel. Produce. Yeah, him. I don't know that he can produce. We've seen Roby Yarventi try to produce. We've seen Sokolov try to produce. We've seen Ostopchuk now. I think that uh, it, Crookshank could be the one guy who might be able to put up some stats. Now, again, playing in a bottom six role, the expectation is not high for, for points. But you'd still like to see somebody be able to chip in regularly from your third line and your fourth line. And I, I think he might be the one that's got the best shot at it. So much of it is about ice time and quality of line mates. Do you get power play time? I was thinking about that in the St. Louis Blues game where Parker Kelly gets a chance to play with Tim Stutzla and Claude Giroux for much of that game. And Kelly actually looked really good. Mm-hmm. You know, he's buzzing around, just does not have that ability to finish consistently. And part of that, I think, is just the confidence, the confidence must just leak out when you play for years and years in a fourth line role. And then all of a sudden you're tasked to play with these guys, but man, he was buzzing around. He was creating things. And, uh, and it's not, it's not that bad of a, of a philosophy when you think about it. And you've talked about this before with the idea of using pairs at Ford and then someone maybe that's, uh, insulating those pairs so they can go do their thing while 
that guy's constantly staying high in the offensive zone and looking after the store. Very, very similar to how we talk about with defensemen, right? Mark mm-hmm. Mathot. We love that guy because, you know, he stayed at home when Eric Carlson went and did his thing. The kind of the same philosophy exists potentially with that, that third forward who maybe isn't the classic top six guy, but maybe sometimes when you're looking for better defense, might be just what the doctor ordered. Or they turn into a top six guy. But in the beginning, right. it's it's what gives you an opportunity to have three more evenly spread out uh, lines. Uh, originally, w- w- on this topic, I was all for Ridley Gregg playing in the top six to start the season, hoping that he could play in the top six on a wing with two studs, and that would allow studs and studs to be spread out more throughout your lineup. And look at look at Zach Hyman. He started out as a third, fourth liner. He had Connor Brown is essentially a third or fourth line guy. But then when he was here in Ottawa, it was he was elevated and you try to hide him with better players and he ends up producing. And then that allows you to have better talent on the lines further down. And as Jacques admitted here that the he's he basically he said since Vladimir Tarasenko left, we've been trying to figure out who the guy should be. You know, we tried it with Joseph, we're trying it now. We tried it with Greg and we're trying with Parker Kelly. He's just this is what you can I guess the one good thing about being terrible, the one good thing about being out of a playoff race is it gives you an opportunity to evaluate players and and uh, some come up with some decent projections as to where they're going to be and what they're going to be come next season. Finishing it out here as we uh, we also have Mark Kastelik standing by. That was a terrible billboarding by me because normally <laughs> off the top, I talk about what's coming up on the show. Oh yeah, we have Mark Kastelik coming up on the show. I probably should have mentioned that out of the gate. A uh, terrible host. But uh, before we get to Mark, Don Chow, the Sen's longtime doctor, is going into the Ottawa Senators' ring of honor. I sometimes want to say wall of fame for some reason. It's the <laughs> ring here. of honor. Yeah, it's the third Ottawa Senator to be named to the ring of honor. And you have Brian Murray up there, Wade Redden, and uh, now the team doctor in there at number three. What did you think? Uh, can I be honest? Of I, course. I, I think it's wonderful. Uh, the man has, has done some, been with the team forever, done, done great things, not, not only for the Senators, but within the game of hockey and within the city of Ottawa. Um, I just, I, I, does he deserve to be in the Ring of Honor? For sure. Certainly does. Mm-hmm. But does he deserve to be on the Ring of Honor before others? Does he deserve to be there before Jason Spezza? Uh, before Craig Anderson? Uh, that That's my only thought on the whole thing i just i don't have a problem with him being there i just think there's others who should be there first and i have a feeling you feel the same way it's like the hall of fame right you you take care of the guys that i hate to say more worthy but certainly i think we can see some of the guys you mentioned i mean no doubt i mean marion hosa uh i mean how, how perfect would it be as jacques martin finishes out what will probably be his final season in the nhl as a head coach how amazing would that be, for example, in his last game to fire him up on the ring of honor? You're absolutely right. It's like nobody's taken anything away from Don Chow. He's been unbelievable and deserves these accolades. But if there's a lineup, as there is with the Hall of Fame, you know, you, you go in order, you know, all the way down. And so, yeah, I mean, Don Chow deserves this. I just, yeah, that was the first thought I had was like, wow, that's, that's, a, that's a great choice, but I'm not sure that he's the next guy in line. That's all. So please don't take it away. We both have the exact same take. Don Chow absolutely deserves this, and we do nothing but congratulate him. Um, now let's get to Mark Kastelik. And by the way, um, now I'll get to this in a second. Let's go to Mark Kastelik. I had a chance to talk to Mark Kastelik this week, and actually I was talking him up a little bit. You'll hear this in the interview. And I was saying, you know what? It's, it's you know, watching these last five games, you know, yeah, you, you've been creating chances. There have been some goal posts. Seems like you're flying around a little bit. You kind of get that sense that you're about to, kind of offensively pop, and then kaboom, first game, because we talked on Wednesday, and uh, the first game back, uh, he takes uh, he gets a goal to open the scoring against the St. Louis well Blues. I'm calling, it, I'm calling it the Sens Nation podcast karma. Hmm? Yeah. Huh? I'm with Boom, you. shakalaka. All right, let's get to Mark Kastelik. This is the conversation, and do you have a problem with Mark Kastelik or something? Like, you're always missing <laughs> the Mark Kastelik interview. <laughs> Sorry, I was busy that day. <laughs> All right, here's the conversation with Mark. I was shocked we were just talking off the air about uh, the fact that it's, I figured it had been, 
you know, a couple of months, but it's uh, it's actually been since November since uh, Mark joined the show. But we're glad that he has. And of course, presentation of Jim K. Ford. Mark, how you doing? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Very good. Thank you. You got to uh, get the good toque going today. And, uh, you know, just uh, it's unfortunate we're still dealing with a little bit of, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of the last of winter and hopefully uh, changing things around. Did the truck get you through the winter? All right, by the way. Uh, the truck was great. Uh, it was so helpful in the snow this year with the, the four wheel drive and the heated seats. And uh, you know, they took great care of me this year and the, the truck's been driving great. Yeah, that's great. The good folks at Jim K. Ford are fantastic. Great supporters of the program. And uh, let's launch in here and talk a little hockey. Uh, let's begin in generalities, I guess. Um, probably in a little different headspace than you were when we last talked in November. What's your general thought on how the, the season has gone? I'm sure it's not uh, not what you were hoping for. Yeah, it's definitely been a, a little bit of a difficult year. Um just thinking back to last season, uh, it was really fun to be battling right down to the wire for a playoff spot. And it was a really fun time of the year. And obviously still just very thankful to be in this situation, but it's, it's, I don't think it's very easy for anybody involved. And I think we're all a little bit frustrated. And uh, I think just trying to look at ourselves in the mirror and kind of see what went wrong or how we can have been better. But, uh, at this point, it's all about trying to take the positives because uh, there's no sense kind of just dwelling on it for too long. And uh, I think that's all we can really do is try to look forward and finish the year as strong as we can and uh, uh, enjoy the time we have with each other. So how would you describe your individual season? Um, you've obviously, uh, and yeah, I, I'd be keen to know, like you know, we all had uh, as, as little kids growing up in the, uh, you know, getting drives home from our dad and dad telling you, you know, what you did right and what you did wrong coming home from the hockey games and stuff. I wondered, you, maybe you could, I don't know, did you talk to your dad about the season that you had this year and, and what were your thoughts about it? I think uh, it's been a little bit of an up and down season. Uh, once again, I think like when we talked last, I was still recovering from that ankle and uh I think that was a little bit of a learning curve. I had never been really injured that uh, long in my career. And uh, I think I kind of came back and I started to find a little bit of a groove. And uh, I think a lot too is just, I think individual and team success go hand in hand. So it's definitely, you kind of find yourself trying to evaluate your individual play each game. But uh, I think wins and losses can kind of, cloud your like uh like cloud your vision on how you think you really played so i think it's been a lot of just trying to like self-reflect and i think uh with the opportunity given this year i think i've tried to make the most of it and do my role well and be a fourth line center that i think kind of everyone knows what to expect from out there and i think from that standpoint i uh, i'm happy with the way I'm able to do my job out there. And obviously you want to improve and expect more out of yourself and offensively and just play in more situations. So I think now with the end of the year approaching, it's a time where everyone's trying to play for something. And I think that's something that I'm just trying to finish here on a strong note and so that I can go into the summer and uh, kind of, assess the season and tweak some things and come back stronger next year. Do you use your dad much as a sounding board or as a, as a resource on, on things to, to try to improve on? Yeah. I talk to him all the time and I think for the most part, uh, the season's so long and you can have a lot of negativity coming in from all different areas. And I think the biggest thing that's my parents, both my parents are really are just great for are just, helping me stay positive and believing in myself and staying confident in my abilities. Cause you can hear a lot of outside noise. And I think from my parents, I'm sure they always think I play great every night. So that's just um, something I'm thankful for. And I think from my dad's experience back in his day, he was in a similar position as I am. And I think um, he helps give me a little bit of pointers here and there and just how I can, stay at the top of my game and stay in the best shape possible and ready for every opportunity. 
my co-host uh, and, and myself were more your dad's age than yours, obviously, and uh, so we remember your dad. Uh, and my co-host is is very much under the impression that your dad pronounced it's, it's Ed, um, and who, he played in the NHL as well uh, for our listeners. And he my, my co-host swears that he pronounced it Castellic, and that you're, you're pronouncing it differently. Is that is that accurate, or is there is there can you maybe set the record straight as to the pronunciation? I think, I think he just I think he says Castellic too, but. I think it's something that maybe back then he really didn't care to have it corrected or I don't know if they were that dialed in on the media side to like get the names right. So I think it was more of something you can say either way and he didn't really feel too passionate about how it's pronounced. (laughs) And I honestly don't either, but I think nowadays they just, they always ask the players themselves how they say it just to make sure they get it right. So I think, Castellic's the way we pronounce it in our family, but we don't take offense to any other ways it's pronounced. <laughs> right. Uh, and the health is good now. Uh, you mentioned uh, the last time we talked, you had the ankle. Mm-hmm. And are you feeling like you, you also had a game recently it pops into my head as, as we talk, where in the first period you had t- what looked like two injuries. Where I was yeah. like, oh, no, Mark's got knocked out of the game here in, in both occasions. Uh, but you stayed in the game. Um, how's the body feel at this time of year? And, and maybe a thought on that period where you it just seemed like everything physically that could go wrong did go wrong that that was a tough period of hockey <laughs> to say the least but I think um ankle wise it's feeling pretty good um I don't think about it at all anymore but it's just such a weird injury where there'll be like one or two random times a month where you just like catch it wrong and you kind of feel it for a split second but other than that I feel pretty pretty good and the body's just and it just has your just your standard bumps and bruises as you get throughout the year. And like that period was just, I think I, I went to the post and got one of those Charlie horses on my like quad and from the post and then uh, just got hit pretty hard. And it was just like a lot going wrong. And I just think I needed a minute to like just relax for a second. And then I, try to battle through it the best I could. And now it's feeling a lot better. That's good. That's good. Um, there was that one game and this happened this is getting to be old news now, but it's the first time you and I have talked since, since it happened, but there was that one game and it got, you know, the media's tongues wagging when you go out after a game, uh, it was after a game where you didn't get a ton of ice time and you went out while basically fans were still trickling out uh, and some of the media noticed it. You went out with a you know bucket of pucks and worked on stick handling and shooting and uh, kind of had your own uh, de facto practice at the end of one of the Senators' games. Um, just to reset for us, can you talk about what that was all about? Because it's, it's kind of rare. We don't see it very often. Yeah, I think from my standpoint, uh, the game probably didn't – we won the game, which was great first off. But personally, I – probably wanted to give a little more and didn't uh, the game didn't go the way I wanted personally. So I think that's not like, uh, like super uncommon in the fourth line position, but I think from a standpoint, normally after a game where your minutes are as high, you probably go on the bike or get a good workout and get a good sweat in after the game. But in my head, I was just like, why don't I just, try to keep it like game simulation or more realistic conditioning for and go back out on the ice and get some touches because I think that's the hardest thing as I've learned as I've been in this position uh, that like the touches you get probably you probably don't get as many of them as you were probably in junior playing 20 minutes a night and feeling the puck for half the game on the power play stuff like that so I think I just want to make sure I don't lose that those skills that you kind of developed as you came through the ranks. So I think I try my best to like get as many touches as I can on practice days. And that was just happened to be after a game that I felt like it was just an idea that popped into my head and try to get some more touches and sweat a little bit instead of going in the, going on the bike and not even feeling the puck, but uh, I also try to like to go on into the shooting room and stuff in the rink and just try to get as many touches as I can. So I don't lose that part of my game. 
As someone who doesn't miss any Senator games, it looks to me, uh, just as, as a viewer, that in the last, I don't know, 10 games or so, that opportunity to score seems to be coming around more frequently for you. Uh, there have been, you know, some goal posts and some missed opportunities. And I remember you breaking a stick in one game on the bench there not, not that long ago. So, you know, yes, there's been, you know, some frustrations about not finishing. But am I right in thinking that it, it feels like, you know, the opportunities are coming around? Like, do you feel like things might be about to pop a little bit where you maybe get a chance to contribute offensively a little more often? Yeah, I think so. I, I think your assessment's right. I, I feel like the last even just um, 10 games seems like a long time to think back. But the last five games or so, I feel like I've had the puck on my stick a little bit more and the guys, my line has been creating a lot more and been given more opportunities. So I think that also goes hand in hand when you have more ice time to make things happen, but also you got to earn the ice time in the same way. So I think, uh, we were able to get in the flow of the game a little more, and I think more opportunities are starting to come. And you can see like that our line is trying to produce a little bit and getting rewarded sometimes. I think uh, in Columbus, we were able to kind of get on the score sheet there as a line. And I think in Carolina, we were in the offensive zone a lot. So when I had that breakaway, I think the last game, a couple of games ago, which was just – a different from position un, seems unfamiliar now, but I feel like I was happy with the move I made and it just an inch away and it could have been different, but I think the uh, opportunities are starting to come more. And hopefully, like you said, that we can cash in on them. Yeah. I, I, I feel like uh, you just some games I watch you and you just, you look like you have the potential, you know, you have the size and, and, the, and you're one of the fastest guys on the team. It's like, you, you look like you're in a, you know, position that you, you maybe, you know, could you know, take over a shift here and there. And I was like, you know, it was, like I say, the last five games, it really has looked like they've been uh, some good things happening for you. Now, I want to ask about the coaching change a little bit. I mean, it must be a little different, you know, mid-season, all of a sudden DJ Smith and Davis Payne aren't there. And instead you've got Jacques Martin and Daniel Offertson back there. Um, may, maybe a word on, you know, what it's like to play for Jacques Martin and Daniel Offertson and, and, uh, and maybe what 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 they're bringing to the table coaching wise. Yeah, well, I think it's uh, no secret that they have great hockey minds and they've been around the game for so long. So um, they they are well respected in their field, and I think they bring a lot of good ideas and different. I think the biggest change has just, just been a little bit of different philosophies, but and personality wise. But obviously, everyone knows DJ was pretty loud and uh energetic guy and jocks a little more quiet and reserved but at the same time they're both in my opinion great coaches in their own way so i think the coaching change was something different i've never experienced that mid-season and i think when your new guy comes in you want to just try to make a good first impression and then go from there and i think over time hopefully you can earn their trust a little bit more and uh yeah, I think over the last little bit, we started to get some more opportunity, and I think he's starting to trust us in all situations, and I think that's a good thing going forward. What's the message he's got going right now? You've got 15 games left in the season, uh, you know, starting the next game, and so I wonder what is he telling you guys? Is he saying play for the you know the fact that you you know you're playing for you know jobs over over the next couple of years, and uh, like how do you? I mean, personally, how do you stay focused? And what is Jacques Martin telling you to stay focused? Uh, or, or how is he saying it uh, in these last 15 games? I think Jacques and even Steve in the management, the, like you said, that we're all playing for something still, whether it's jobs or pride or the logo on the front. And uh, I think their main message is that they're just going to continue to, like we're not going to fold over and just uh, – just wait, uh, uh, wish the rest of the season away. I think there's still a lot we can learn and uh, learn from. And I think a lot of guys can still improve a little bit. And I think we can just, con they can continue to teach us a lot of different things and learn how to play the right way and manage games and little things like that, that I think are kind of more of a big focus at this point. And just, um, 
I think that's been kind of the main message. So with with Steve Steos, the GM of the club, and the new owner, Michael Andlauer, I'm sure you've had a chance to talk to both. And, and I wonder, is it um, do they have formal meetings with the team or is it kind of just uh, pass in the hallway, say a few words and then and kind of move along? Um, they're always around, so you always kind of talk to them on a day to day basis, whether it's a few words or just how how's your, how are you doing and stuff like that. But uh, I think they just addressed us after the trade deadline and that was probably the the only formal meeting we had and that's kind of I feel like a normal thing once the trade deadline's passed and that's your group group for the rest of the season they kind of set the expectations for the rest of the year and um yeah fair enough very good um we've had um NHL GM meetings happening this week and so the media is talking a lot about rule changes in the game and I wonder, do you, Mark Kastelik, if, if you could be part of the decision-making process and the rules committee and, and making changes in the game, is there like is there something about the NHL rule book where you'd say, I wouldn't mind seeing a change here? Uh, I don't know. It's probably just like the the review stuff. I think I saw the, the new changes where they – something they can review something now. I forget what it – penalties maybe? Like – is that what the new rule is? Yeah, I think there's also like um, being able to review puck over glass and maybe yeah. high sticks and things like that, but an expansion of of, uh, of instant replay and coaches' yeah. challenges. I think that's a good one. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty happy with where the game's at and where all the rules are, and I don't really think I have any uh, particular like things I'm wishing for. I just I think the rules are great how they are. That is a good, good, safe, uh, good, safe answer. Nobody's going to second guess you on that one. Um, yeah, I don't think I have a whole lot more for you today. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I got for today. So let's, uh, why don't we wrap it up right there? Mark okay. Kostelik joining us here on the Jim K. Ford Sends Nation podcast. Maybe we can, you know, on garbage bag day or something like that, maybe we can catch up one more time and, mm-hmm. um, and see you off for the summer and see what you're up to. But, uh, as for today, we really appreciate you joining us here on the show, and uh, we shall talk to you next time. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks for having me again. And there he is. Sends forward Mark Kastelik joining us here on the program. And before we go today, Greg, uh, congratulations to the Kachucks. Brady and Emma announcing this week they're having a baby boy come September. Your, I got. I mean, if, if we're going to do a draft, uh, a draft preview for, what, 2042? I yeah. got to think he's got to be your number one. Got the <laughs> uncle, got the grandpa, got the dad. Hell, even the aunt is a hell of a field hockey player. That's got to be your number one prospect right now, right? Yeah, I would think so. He's he's at the head of the list so far of all the all the babies. Although, although Steve, I don't know that we've done a thorough uh, investigation into all the babies born in 2024. I'm not sure how many other hockey players uh, gave birth. Uh, will will give birth in 2024, so we're not sure. Um but yeah, good for him. And and I've, yeah. all the jokes about the Godfather Matthew that ought to be interesting. Right? Yeah, absolutely. I was thinking about that this week. With um, it's been an interesting couple of years for the Kachucks. You know, they got they got married last year in a big splashy ceremony, and then now they take the plunge again in uh, in the world of parenthood. And I was thinking about that wedding last year. How weird would that have been? Where you've got your groomsman in Mark Stone. And Matthew Kachuk, like just not that long, like a month or so after they'd played each other in the Stanley Cup final. And when the priest goes, who has the ring? I'm sure Mark Stone's Uh, going, right here, baby, right here. (laughs) Huh? At Matthew's expense. (laughs) Yeah, all right. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate you being here as always. Don't forget our website is sensnationhockey.com. Thank you to Mark Kastelik for joining us today. Thanks to our great sponsors. Jim K. Ford, Dunrobin Distilleries, and Seven Seals Whiskey. Greg, what do you got going this weekend? Anything big? I'm, Anything I'm, I'm, shaking? Yeah, I'm just going to Montreal. That's all I got going. Oh, yes, of course. That's yes, right. My Lebanon bad. camp, buddy. Got to prepare for the for a couple of different events this summer. Beauty. Okay, well, enjoy that, and uh, good luck with it, and we shall talk to you in our next episode. For sure. Thanks. Thanks.